has throttled South Africa's economy. And even before the pandemic, the country was in its second recession in as many years. As South Africans face hunger, government efforts at delivering relief have floundered amid widespread allegations of fraud and mismanagement. The executive director for the Center for Development and Bernstein believes that the current attitude of the government towards the business sector isn't making things any better. Let's get straight into our conversation with her. She joins us tonight. And good evening. Firstly, what kind of attitude does the government have towards business right now? Well, I think you have to look at the way in which the economic part of the lockdown was handled. You have to look at current government policies and attitudes. And you need to look at the ANC economic recovery strategy. And essentially, I think government believes in the developmental state and that it's the role of the state to almost discipline business. Um, I, I don't think that's working in South Africa. I think we need a very different approach. We need to free up the private sector because, after all, the state is weak and corrupt and not able to do an effective job. And we need to give as much room to the private sector as we possibly can to save the firms that we have and to start building a bridge to recovery. And so I don't think you should discipline uh, firms. Of course, you need basic regulations, but I think we need to free up business so that the private sector can be at the heart of how South Africa recovers from our many ailments and catastrophes. And that isn't what's happening. It's, we're not seeing that yet. Of course, South Africa's private sector is not without its own challenges and, quite frankly, pro problems when it comes to um, some of the issues that do need to accommodate South Africa needing to develop. So when you talk about the free reign that needs to be given, which areas are we referencing here in particular? And how do you see that happening in, in terms of how different would it be, would it need to be to what it is right now? Look, everyone acknowledges that the South African economy is way over-regulated. The president himself has said that, and that we've dropped 50 places in the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index about regulation. So there's no doubt we have to lift regulations in a whole lot of areas. I'm not in favor of lifting all regulations. I'm in favor of health and safety regulations and various others. So we're not saying everything, but I am saying that we need to understand how desperate South Africa's situation is. We probably now have some 12 million people unemployed. And Kathy, you and I have talked about this before, but just stop and think about that for a moment. It's not just small firms or informal firms that are in desperate straits. Some of our bigger firms are struggling to survive the situation that we're in. A uh, very deep sort of economic stagnation or worse, and then the whole COVID lockdown that has had devastating impact on South Africa's economy and our tax revenue. And all I'm saying is not that the private sector is perfect, far from it, but that in a society where our state has been decimated by state capture, by wholesale corruption. We can't even sort of sort out PPE without enormous corruption all over the country. You have to recognize that the only capacity we have in many sectors of the economy comes from private actors. They need to be, we need to regulate that, but we need to free them up so that the private sector machine can start helping to drive South Africa out of what is a really, really terrible situation for millions and millions of people. And which regulations, maybe the top three that come to mind that you think of, that you think these could be eased up a bit? Well, it's now good that we've opened up the economy almost totally. I thought the cigarette and tobacco, the cigarette and alcohol regulations were very destructive and actually very hard to understand. Um, I think that we have to look at the labor market. We have to look at how we free up smaller firms and um, even sort of medium-sized firms to 
to operate more freely. We've got to change the rules of the labor market, not all of them, but we need to make it easier to hire employees and to organize very different kinds of arrangements in order to cope with the situation we're in now. I think we also have to get rid of all these regulations that hold back mainly small business and new firms. And we need to look at the mining sector. We've just released a document written by a very prominent veteran in the mining industry, the work that Norman and Bazima did for with Business South Africa, and it's devastating. One of their main recommendations, if we are to get new mining investment, which we're not getting at the moment, is to, to move away from the approach that we've taken where the regulations change every few years, they're not certain, and there are far more regulations affecting, for example, mining companies in South Africa than almost anywhere else in the world. So almost every sector you could look at, you can see that we need a different attitude to business, not because business is perfect. We need competition and we need transparency, but we need to say, how are we going to free up the market to help South Africa be much more effective? Um, and you can see it in almost any sector that you want. So, so I'm going to come down then to the issue of, of small businesses because I think the lockdown issues have pretty much some, have somewhat been dealt with now that we're at level two. So small businesses, you talk about how um, you, the hiring of people needs to be re relooked, uh, payment arrangements. Does that ultimately come down to the national minimum wage? Well, there are two issues. The one is collective bargaining, and the South African system of collective bargaining means that big unions and big employers can sit around a table and make a deal on wages and conditions which suits them, but they can then apply to the minister who can extend that to all the parties who weren't party to that deal. So we're saying collective bargaining should involve the people in the room and who they represent, and not people who are not part of that discussion. So, and that mainly affects unemployed people and small firms. So that's one example. I think the national minimum wage implemented in early 2019, we've yet to see significant um, independent research on its impact, but we know that many sectors of our economy were nowhere near that wage. And so it's hard to believe there isn't an impact, but we don't know for certain yet. In, in, in many ways, and much of this legislation that you are speaking about, part of the purpose or the role that it serves is also to try and deal with the inequality rate in South Africa because the private sector on its own, given you know, free reign, has not necessarily fully come to the party when it comes to issues such as salaries, etc., which is why we have um, the unions, I suppose, always raising issues of, of, of salaries, even within government. So when you begin to take away those basic, infra those basic processes that are in place, what is left behind and what kind of South Africa does that ultimately lead us to, especially on the question of inequality? But Kathy, you're misunderstanding me. The sure. key cause of inequality in South Africa is between those people who have a job and the 12 million or so who do not have a job. That is the key cause of key root of inequality in South Africa today, obviously caused by our history and all sorts of things and some government policy. I'm saying that if we want to be a much more labor intensive economy, we need to make it easier for firms to hire particularly young, inexperienced workers who've never worked before and to find ways to do that. And I'm saying that the incumbents, the status quo, firms and the unions, not that we should get away with collective bargaining, not at all, but they should only bargain for the people involved around that table, not for newcomers into sectors, which holds back small firms and new black firms amongst others. So I'm saying we need to think about a different approach to inequality and one of the key 
issues in terms of inequality is that South Africa has created a welfare state, which I certainly support, but you need a thriving economy to pay for that. And our objective should not be to get more and more people getting money from the state, but to get more and more people weaned off that system and being self-sufficient. So if you want to talk about inequality, there are many issues we need to deal with, how we make this a much more labor-intensive economy and how we um, improve the quality of education and skills and training, which is really very poor for a country of our income and uh, level of development. We can fix that, which will help many millions of people. And we need to look at the way our cities are structured and a whole lot of other things. So we're not saying holus bolus um, throw out our collective bargaining system. But what we are saying is that South Africa is in such deep crisis on every front, the fiscal crisis, growth, employment, the social fabric of our society in the last six months and before. I don't want to return to where we were before. I want South Africa to be a much more fast-growing economy that includes millions more people who've been excluded because we aren't creating jobs for people with the low skills that they have so that they can get into the economy and start to build up their skills base. So that's part of what we're saying, that we need to think differently if we're ever going to deal with the really fundamental cause of one of the fundamental causes of inequality, which is between people who have employment and those who do not. All right. Anne Bernstein, let's leave it there for tonight. Thank you for your time on News at Prime. And of course, Anne Bernstein is the executive director of the Center for Development and Enterprise. Mark Lewis is standing by. He has your latest sports update.